From risking her life and well-being for her investigative journalism to accomplishing something only done in a Jules Verne novel, today we'll be talking to you about the intrepid Nellie Bly. I'm your host, Leah. I'm Phil. And I'm Steve. And I think you'll be astonished at the adventures of Elizabeth Jane Cochran. If you have an appetite for the strange and bizarre, then pull up a chair and grab a spoon for another intriguing serving of Remnant Stew. Remnant Stew is gluten-free, organic, made from all natural, free-range ingredients and guaranteed to provide the recommended daily serving of curiosity. Well, now before we get into those amazing stories about the intrepid Nellie Bly, let's take a look at the calendar, shall we? All right. Wow, we were just flying through 2022 already. Get your date books out, folks. Here are some good ones. March 28th. On this day, oh, I remember this. On this day in 1979, a coolant leak at the Three Mile Island Unit 2 nuclear reactor outside of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, uh, leads uh, leads to the core overheating and a partial meltdown. I do. I kind of remember. I was a kid, but I kind of remember hearing about yeah. about that when it happened. I was in college, and uh, yeah, it was it was greatly talked about. And you know, because at the time, nuclear power seemed like it was all all the good stuff. And then uh, we kind of saw. Well, there's there's still a lot of people that love nuclear power today, but uh, right, but uh, it does have some downsides too when things go bad. So. So when okay, so how when did Chernobyl happen? That was 1986. That was okay, seven so, years later. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Right. All right. Then we have uh, okay this Wednesday, March 30th. I like this day. It's Manatee Appreciation Day. Hey, I appreciate them. <laughs> I love manatees. This day seeks to raise awareness about the herbivorous creatures. Manatees are aquatic mammals that mostly eat plants. Their peaceful behavior, combined with their long, robust bodies, earned them the nickname Sea Cow. My robust body earned me the same name. <laughs> <laughs> oh, her boys are toast. <laughs> Manatee Appreciation Day is believed to have been started by the nonprofit organization Save the Manatee Club. The club got its start in 1981 when Florida Governor Bob Graham and singer Jimmy Buffett made their mission to protect manatees. So, I didn't know. So are they endangered or kind of approaching? I don't think that they are, but it, like anything uh, in in the wild, as habitat uh, decreases. Yeah, then uh, they 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 are. Well, it's a it's a concern. Let's just say it that way. And do you remember us talking about manatees before? I don't even remember what episode this was where they <laughs> <laughs> they control their buoyancy through farting <laughs> and withholding their. Oh yeah, yeah. flatulence. Anyway, yes, yes. Yeah, the flatulent manatees. <laughs> well, now of course, uh, speaking of flatulence, uh, April first is April Fool's Day. That's dun, right. Dun, dun. Yeah. Now, last year we created an. An outstanding April Fool's themed episode called Hoaxes and Pranks. Now, I can't think of a better way to spend April Fool's Day than to go back and listen to that great episode. It's season two, episode seven, and it begins with the great Orson Welles' War of the Worlds radio broadcast. Yeah, that's one of my favorite episodes, I yeah, think. Yeah, it was, a, it was a really fun one to do. It seemed like I remember there was, some, there was something about Abraham Lincoln and an exploding bladder. I'm not sure what the... <laughs> What part of that episode? Now, Tuesday, April the 5th, is National Librarian Day. Hey. That's good. Isn't there an old song called Marion Librarian? I don't remember. I remember. It just hits, nope. a, hits a note in my head. Anyway, make sure that you drop by your local branch and extend a hearty thanks to those wonderful people who help us to find our way through the stacks. And then, okay, now this is, this is really exciting because Thursday, April the 7th, it's a double special day. As it is National Burrito Day. I can get behind that. Yeah. I love burritos. The first mention of burrito appeared in the Dictionary of Mexicanisms in 1895. <laughs> Mexicanisms. Mexican, okay. Mexicanisms, yeah. Okay. Uh, All right. Burrito in Spanish means little donkey. And it's believed that burritos were given their name because when they rolled, uh, when they're rolled, they look like the bed rolls that donkeys used to carry on their backs. So a burrito is defined as being a rolled tortilla with meat or other food inside. But wait, there's more. Also on April the 7th, it's 
National No Housework Day. I am so going to enjoy <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> The point of th today is to give yourself a break from housework and do something else that you enjoy instead without worrying. Like eating burritos. Yeah. The Tech cleaning mm, can wait until yummy. tomorrow. So sit down, relax, and eat a burrito on right. no those double days. Day. <laughs> Great days. Okay, so Steve and I thought it would be interesting to dedicate one episode a quarter or for a year that's to doing quarters work, right? Yeah, four that's years, right. right. For a year. Let's clear that up. Thank you. <laughs> so to doing a deep dive into some one interesting person. So instead of bringing you a bunch of stories loosely connected by a topic, these quote portrait episodes would focus on just one person to give you insight into their incredible characters and the amazing things they accomplished. And this portrait is all about Nellie Bly, who lived uh -huh. from 1864 to 1922 and did many things that were just not seen as proper by the standards of the day. Very interesting person, Nellie Bly. Um, you know, we've done a deep dive before on uh, Robert Ripley. You remember that, well, about, that's right. That's uh, right. We before. really did. And it was such a fun episode to, to, to learn about him. But I really enjoyed doing this one on Nellie Bly. Okay, so Nellie Bly was born May 5th, 1864 in Cochran's Mill, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, but that's not quite accurate because Nellie Bly was a pen name uh -huh. uh, she, that was assigned many years later when she was a writer. Right. Her original given name was Elizabeth Jane Cochran. Her father, Michael Cochran, began working as a mill worker, but eventually give, ended up owning the mill where he worked. So Cochran's mill is named for him. He right. had 10 children. My goodness. 10 children with his, just his first wife. But wait, there's wife. more. His, but his wait, first there's wife. more. And then five more with his second wife. Including Elizabeth. Michael died in 1871 when Elizabeth was only six years old. Oh, she was very young when she lost her father. Yeah. So <laughs> as a child, Elizabeth was called Pinky. Pinky. <laughs> and she always loved to wear that color. And right. as a teenager, though, she dropped that nickname and also added an E to her last name of Cochran because she felt it made her more sophisticated. Now, that is such a teenager thing to it do. It is. Yeah, right? <laughs> it just needs an E right but here. But an E. Cochrane. Yeah. Okay. So at, at age 15, she enrolled in Indiana Normal School, which was located in Indiana County, Pennsylvania, now called Indiana University of Pennsylvania. Yeah. Until we did this, I didn't know there was an Indiana University of Pennsylvania. Well, now you know. Oh. She only completed one term, though, as she had to drop out for lack of funds. Mm. Soon after, her mother relocated the family to the Pittsburgh area. And around her 20th birthday, so this would be in the mid-1880s, 1884, the Pittsburgh remember. Dispatch ran an article titled, What Girls Are Good For? Oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> According to the article, women were basically good for birthing children and cleaning house, but not much else. Oh, that's a very limited view. So, yeah. Yeah, we've got a couple of nieces that are rolling their eyes right now. <laughs> well, Elizabeth didn't like it either. She, uh, she wrote a fiery letter to the editor using the pseudonym... Lonely Orphan Girl. Lonely Orphan Girl. The editor was so impressed with her passion and her writing style that he ran an advertisement in the paper asking for Lonely Orphan Girl to come and identify herself. When Elizabeth introduced herself in mm. person to the editor, he offered her an opportunity to write an article for the paper. Nice. So still writing under the name Lonely Orphan Girl. Yeah. Elizabeth entitled her article, The Girl Puzzle. That's a good name for an article, The Girl Puzzle. Okay. <laughs> well, it definitely catches your attention. Sure. In it, she wrote about the impact that divorce had on women. Oh. She argued for the need of reform of the divorce laws, which were often unfair, to, not just often unfair. They were just straight out unfair right. to women. Once again, the editor, George Madden, was impressed. This time, he offered Elizabeth a full-time job writing for the Pittsburgh Dispatch. Now, so this is, she was about 20 years old, right. just newly 20. Uh, this was quite remarkable for the time because most women that wrote articles for the newspapers wrote, you know, fashion, society, yeah. gardening. Um, Elizabeth told Madden that newspapers should be reporting the stories of ordinary people and that she wanted to write about working women. So opinionated much? Yeah. Yes, <laughs> you wouldn't, was, wouldn't tell. Right. Yeah. It was considered improper in the 1880s for women to write under their own name. So a popular Stephen Foster song at the time was called Nellie Bly. And I'd heard that oh, yeah. song. Nelly, and I just Nelly with assumed, a Y. Yeah. yeah. N -E -L -L -Y. Yeah. But I just, I had heard that song and I had I assumed that the song was, was about, about her. her. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. I mean, and not really, but it's a love song. Yeah. Right. But uh, yeah, I, I 
thought it had or been for her. <laughs> yeah, for her or just inspired by her. Yeah. But Madden suggested that Elizabeth write under the name Nellie Bly, N E L L I E Bly, as the spunky name appeared to suit her personality. <laughs> so she so the song came first before Nellie, Nellie Bly. Bly. Right. So it was um, I guess it was a name <laughs> that was out there in the consciousness of of the community. Well, that's pretty cool. Well, now Nellie began writing a series of articles about working women. In order to get her story, she began working undercover at a factory in Pittsburgh. Her first-person accounts of the stories of the women she met were a hit with the dispatch's readers. She exposed child labor laws, low mm-hmm. wages, and unsafe working conditions. Not only did she expose those conditions, but she also made recommendations for addressing them. Madden, who, who was her editor, later wrote that Bly was full of fiery passion and youthful exuberance. However, the newspaper began receiving complaints about Bly's articles from, guess who, the factory owners. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Imagine that. They got mad? Right. No. They were prominent and powerful forces in Pittsburgh. So soon, yep. she was back to writing about fashion, theater, and other traditional women's subjects. Well, okay, so if you think about Pittsburgh, I mean, it's all about steel. Right. Yeah. It's the great it steel. Factors. So I wonder if it was like yeah. Carnegie. and Yes, probably some and, of them. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Well, dissatisfied with this turn of events, she was determined to do something that no girl had ever done before. Still only 21, she decided to travel to Mexico and report from there as a foreign correspondent. (laughs) Traveling by train with her mother, she gave great detailed accounts of her journey, uh, which included a midnight stop in El Paso, Texas. Now, I've read quite a bit of her her autobiography. I've just got to say she's incredibly detailed in her writing. It's, she paints such a vivid picture. So this is just a little quote. Uh, we arrived in El Paso so late at night that it was very dark. There were no cabs or cabmen, and they were talking 1885 here, uh, or even wheelbarrows around, and the darkness prevented us from getting a view of our surroundings. With my mother's arm still tightly clasped in mine, we sought the outer darkness. I saw a man with a lantern on his arm and went to him and asked directions to a hotel. He replied that they were all closed at this hour, but if I could be satisfied with a second-class house, he would conduct me to where he lived. We were only too glad for any shelter, so without one thought of where he might take us, we followed the light of his lantern as he went ahead. It was only a short walk through the sandy streets to the place. There was one, there was one room, unoccupied, and we gladly paid for it, and by the aid of a tallow candle, found our way to bed. Can you imagine yeah. how adventuresome that is? You know? yeah. I can't imagine that. Like, that's the way <laughs> horror movies begin. <laughs> right. I mean, or true crime stories. Yes. Right. Like, I, there's no way I would be in El Paso at midnight <laughs> and just walk up to a man and say, hey, hey uh, you know, I'm going to go home with you. Okay. So. <laughs> Follow me. Well, the train for Mexico City would not leave until 6 p.m. the following day. So Nellie and her mother spent the day touring El Paso. Quote, El Paso was a rather lively town. Hmm. A number, it still is. <laughs> <laughs> a number of different rail lines center here, and the hotels are filled year-round with health and pleasure seekers of all descriptions. The houses are mostly modern here, with here and there the adobe huts which once marked this border. The courthouse and jail combined is a fine brick structure that any large city might boast of. Several very pretty little gardens brighten up the town with their green velvety plants and tropical trees. The only objection I found to El Paso was its utter lack of grass. Yeah, it's still that way. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't grow there. I used to do some uh, workshops in El Paso about 10 years ago. And yeah, when you fly in, there's there's no grass. The citizens are perfectly free. They speak and do and think as they please. And that hasn't changed much either, I don't think. (laughs) Well, now for two and a half cents each, they took a ferry across the Rio Grande to what was then known as El Paso del Norte, but today it's Ciudad Juarez. There, they caught the train to Mexico City. In 1886, most people in the United States considered Mexico to be a backward and unattractive country. Nellie's writing realistically detailed both the good and the bad about Mexico City. Upon arriving in Mexico City, she writes, quote, One continually sees poverty and wealth side by side in Mexico, and they don't turn up their noses at each other either. Describing the people, she writes, quote, No Mexican lady thinks it proper to wear a hat into church. She thinks it shows disgust, hence the fashion of wearing lace mantillas. It's kind of like a lace or silk scarf that's worn over the hair and the shoulders. In Mexico City, there is nothing handsomer 
than a lady neatly clad in black with a mantilla gracefully wrapped around her head, under which are visible coal black hair, sparkling eyes, mm -hmm. and beautiful teeth. A ragged skirt and a shawl encircling a babe with its head on its mother's shoulders, fast asleep. Black silky hair, which trails on the floor as she kneels. Her slender brown face raised suppliantly in devotion. is one of the prettiest, though most common, sights in Mexico on a Sunday morning. Hmm. Beautiful description, isn't it? It is very beautiful. Wow. Her articles wired back to Pittsburgh describe the lives and customs of the people of Mexico. Well, you've really spent a lot of time talking about the bullfights, and uh, <laughs> they, were, they were pretty gruesome affairs. Hmm. Um, she also talked about the, the poverty of the common people. She was struck by the widespread addiction to playing the lottery, noting that people would even pawn their clothes in order to buy a ticket. Wow. She also described courtship, wedding ceremonies, the popularity of tobacco smoking, and the habits of the soldiers, including an early mention of their marijuana use. <laughs> At the time, Mexico was under the control of a dictator named Porfino Diaz. Now they ran afoul of the dictator when she wrote an article protesting the arrest and imprisonment of a journalist. When Mexican authorities learned of Nelly's report, they threatened her with arrest, prompting her to flee the country. Safely home, she accused Diaz of being a tyrannical czar, suppressing the Mexican people, and controlling the press. Mm, goodness. Nelly gained greater acclaim when her reports for the Pittsburgh Dispatch were published in book form. Six months in Mexico became a hot seller. Nellie began to feel that Pittsburgh wasn't quite big enough for her anymore. <laughs> so one day she left a note on her desk which read, quote, I'm off to New York. Look out for me. Bly. <laughs> <laughs> Watch out. Here I come. And now for something completely off topic and off kilter. Brace yourself for the oddity du jour. Okay, so just taking a break from, uh, from Nellie Bly. As we mentioned quite often, I'm originally from the Commonwealth of Kentucky, and so this oddity du jour was of particular interest to me. Kentucky. There was a, a mystery haunting many Kentucky communities, an ugly black film that plagued the towns and formed on many outdoor surfaces. So like on stop signs, porch furniture, <laughs> siding, fences, basketball hoops, cars. It's even been found growing on the dome of the Kentucky State Capitol building in Frankfurt. Wow. So, okay, so from a distance, it looks like a layer of soot, you know, like right, right. London or something, yeah. in the, you know, in the 1800s. Uh, but up close, it looks like a thin black felt. No matter how often they seemed to scrub and clean the black film, it would always return. But it mm. only plagued certain communities and not others. Wow. Huh. These neighborhoods spent years wondering why the dark film that's a nuisance to clean always returns. And it's hard to clean. Like, you have to scrub it. I mean, like. Clorox like, doesn't do it then, huh? Well, yeah. no, they use Clorox. They have to use Clorox to scrub it. But, um, but you have to put your back into it. Yeah, it's you not have like you just. And by the way, Clorox, if you're looking for a podcast of fun, <laughs> bring it. Go ahead. <laughs> Some suspected that this was ash from chimney smoke, while right. others blame nearby factories. But finally, it became enough of a problem that someone investigated and got to the bottom of the problem. The black filth that afflicted some towns but not others was determined to be a fungus. Specifically, oh my goodness, here we go. Scientific Ooh. term 101, here we go. <laughs> Badonia, Badonia. Badonia neosensis. Well, that's good. It's a fungus that is predominantly found in the vicinity of distilleries. Oh, distilleries. Oh, that's right. Oh. <laughs> so Kentucky's known for its yeah, bourbon, bourbon production. Yeah. And Can in the be. process of distilling bourbon, there's a certain amount of product that's lost and the bourbon that evaporates is called the angel's share as opposed to the, <laughs> the, devil's, cut. the devil's cut, which is, you know, absorbed into the wooden barrels, yeah. but it's the angel's share that is responsible for, for leaving its mark on the neighboring houses and buildings. Mm. <laughs> wow. <laughs> the name suggests that ethanol vapors reach the heavens, but actually research shows the vapors filter out traveling as far as a mile and then fall back down to earth. Right. When that L, Ethanol combines with a hint of moisture like morning dew or humidity. There goes the fungus. So you mean there's a distillery so, within a mile of the state capital? Yeah, apparently <laughs> At least, so. Oh, apparently wow. so. Yeah. And uh, and At so least one companies. Uh -huh. So companies. I mean, not companies. <clears throat> well, everybody that is afflicted by this is uh, has nicknamed it the whiskey fungus. Whiskey fungus. <laughs> <laughs> and, but the companies call it the dark side of the angels' share. So whatever uh -huh. you call it, the communities. 
around the distilleries, they hate it, and they have they've tried to make the the bourbon companies you know address it and do something about it, but to no avail because it's just it's just a thing. Yeah, um, it's it's a nuisance, but it's not a health hazard or anything like that. And so this makes a mess. Yeah, it just makes a mess. But whatever. Uh, however they feel about the fungus, like everybody's still proud to be <laughs> <laughs> part of their bur- yeah, to It's part our of fungus. And to be, that's right. So there you go. It's, it's a matter of fun. Kentucky pride. Need to feed a hungry mind? Every week, Your Brain on Facts brings you science. Why does mint feel cold? History. King Charles II was so inbred, his parents didn't bother educating him. Music. Many hit songs were written for revenge. Technology. The very first video game was made on an oscilloscope. And every other topic in this big, beautiful world of ours. Check out Your Brain on Facts on your podcast app or at yourbrainonfacts.com. Well, when we left Nellie Bly a few minutes ago, she had left a note on her desk in Pittsburgh saying that she was off to New York. So after a few months, Nellie managed to get a job with the New York World, a newspaper which uh, just happened to be owned by Joseph Pulitzer. Yeah, that, that Pulitzer. One. Yeah, that one. That Pulitzer. Soon after arriving at the World, her editors approached her with an idea. And this is a quote from her. On the 22nd of September, 1887... I was asked by the world if I could have myself committed to one of the asylums for the insane in New York with a view to writing a plain and unvarnished narrative of the treatment of the patients therein. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, this right. isn't going to go well for them. And, and, and the that's... methods of management. Did yeah. I think I had the courage to go through such an ordeal? Could I assume the characteristics of insanity to such a degree that I could pass the doctor's examination and live for a week among the insane? I said I believed I could. I had some faith in my ability as an actress and thought I could assume insanity long enough to accomplish any mission entrusted to me. Could I pass a week in the insane warp of Blackwell Island? I said I could, and I would, and I did. <laughs> okay, so so that's a big thing to ask her to do. Right. Because, I mean, it was very well known yeah. that these asylums at the time were just brutal places. And dangerous. And I'm surprised that she was concerned about acting insane because it really so we were talking about how divorce is so right so one-sided back then men if they just did not want their wives around anymore they could just have, have them, them committed, committed. Yes, they, they didn't have to be insane yeah they could convince the judge that's right and so i didn't i don't feel like she had to act insane not too badly and so uh i'm surprised that she was concerned but, about it well i think she wanted to speed up the process perhaps so but you know it's not it's not an easy task though to actually be admitted to the asylum uh, on her own. So here's what she decided to do. She decided to check herself into a boarding house called Temporary Homes for Females. She stayed up all night to give herself the wide-eyed look of a disturbed woman and began making accusations that the other boarders were insane. There you go. Bly told the assistant matron, quote, "There are so many crazy people about, and one can never tell what they will do." She refused to go to bed and eventually scared so many of the other boarders that the police were called to take her to the nearby courthouse. At the courthouse, she went about asking the police officers if they had seen her trunks. Have you seen my trunks? She had asked them, and she also asked the judge, whose name was Judge Duffy. After he examined her, the judge exclaimed, quote, Poor child, she is well dressed and a lady. Her English is perfect, and I would stake everything on her being a good girl. I am positive she is somebody's darling. I don't know what to do with her. Well, she must be taken care of, though. Nellie smiled to herself when one of the officers said, Put her on the island. But then the boarding house matron said, Don't. She's a lady, and it would kill her to be put on the island. There's been some foul work here, said the judge. I believe this child has been drugged and brought to this city. (laughs) We will send her to Bellevue Hospital for examination. At that, the judge sent for an ambulance and told the driver to be kind to the girl. Oh, goodness. 
So she, she got a nice ride. She got a nice ride. She got a nice ride. So she encountered so, kind people. Right. So, you know, the, the, the matron at the house was reluctant to even call. We kept trying to encourage her to go to sleep, calm down, everything. But, you know, she, you know, finally they were, the other they didn't have any residents were getting really worried irritated. about her. So. Yeah. Right, they yeah. didn't have any other any other options. So, right. Okay, so upon arriving at the hospital, she was seen by a doctor. Quote, the doctor looked clever, and I had not one hope of deceiving him, but I was determined to keep up the farce. Put out your tongue, the doctor ordered briskly. I don't want to, she answered. <laughs> you must. You are sick, and I am a doctor. Well, that makes sense right there. <laughs> so she sure. said, You're the one who's sick. I'm the doctor, see? <laughs> and she says, I'm not sick and never was. I only want my trunks. Is she talking? She's talking about luggage correct right. her trunks okay. yeah her, her trunks. trunks have you seen my know. trunks yeah. yeah i don't know maybe she's talking about <laughs> no not her swimming her trunks or <laughs> different kind. anyway so her after luggage. after reluctantly putting out her tongue the doctor felt her pulse and listened to the beating of her heart i had not the least idea quote i'm saying <laughs> i had not the least idea how the heart of an insane person beat <laughs> <laughs> so i held my breath all the while he listened well it can just say to a different drum <laughs> <laughs> <I> guess <somewhat. laughs> Then he examined the pupils of my eye with a light. I was so puzzled to know what insanity looked like in the eye. So I thought the <laughs> best thing was to stare. <laughs> I held my stare without blinking the whole time he was examining me. What <laughs> what drugs have you been taking? The doctor asked. <laughs> drugs? I don't know what drugs are. The doctor concluded that she had been using Belladonna and admitted her to Bellevue Hospital. Belladonna, you, that came up in another episode, didn't it? Yeah, yeah I'm sure it did. Yeah. Um, so, and so <coughs> Bellevue Hospital is a hospital, not the not the not an well, it's it a hospital that does have a mental mental ward, ward to yeah. it. Okay. Yeah, that it's like an intermediary. It's not the permanent one. Yeah. So, upon leaving the doctor, she walked down the hallway and began chatting with the patients. The first person she met identified herself as Miss Ann Neville, who explained that she had been sick from overwork. She had been working as a chambermaid, and when her health gave way, she was sent to charity home or to a charity home to be treated. Her nephew, who was a waiter out of work and being unable to pay for her expenses at the home, had her transferred to Bellevue. Is there anything wrong with you mentally? Nellie asked. No, the woman answered. I have nothing wrong with my brain, just exhaustion. The doctors refuse to listen to me, and it is useless to say anything to the nurses. So another woman she met could only speak German, but blind deduced that this woman had come to the U.S. seeking employment, but due to her lack of English, was instead placed in the mental hospital. Both of these women, she says, uh, Nellie says, appeared to be as sane as I was. After being served a meal of cold meat and colder potatoes, uh-huh. Nellie sat with the other good. patients in the hallway. Quote, all the windows in the hall were open and the cold air began to tell on me. It grew so cold indeed as to be almost unbearable and complained it, of it to the nurses, and I complained of it to the nurses. But they answered curtly that I was in a charity place and I would not expect much else. Oh, so oh wow. Yeah, that kept coming yeah. up. She was told that over and over again. Uh, you're in a charity hospital. You, you can't expect anything better than what you're getting. So eventually she was given a short gown and a thin blanket and sent to bed. In the middle of the night, she was awakened by a doctor and a nurse examining her. The doctor said... I know that face. Where do you come from? Afraid that her cover had been blown, she replied, Cuba. (laughs) (laughs) What do do you do in New York? The doctor asked. Nothing, she replied. Can you work? No, senor. (laughs) (laughs) Are you a woman of the town? And and so, yeah, he's asking if she's a prostitute at that point. She says, I don't know, but what are you talking about? I've always lived at home. The doctor looked at the nurse and said, positively demented. I consider it a hopeless case. Just on that little bit. Just on that little bit. Just on that little bit. Yeah. She needs to be put where someone will take care of her. And thus, she was committed to Blackwell Island. Blackwell dun, dun, Island. Dun. Yeah. The next day, she and some of the other patients, including the two women mentioned earlier, were taken to the dock where they were locked into a foul-smelling room on an old ferry. Upon reaching the island, she was taken roughly by the arm by a male attendant and pulled off the boat. Quote, what is this place? I asked of the man who had his fingers sunk into the flesh of my arm. Quote, Blackwell Island, an insane place where you'll never get out of. She then writes, quote, upon walking up to the asylum, my feeling of satisfaction at having attained the object of my work were greatly dampered 
by the look of distress on the faces of my companions. Mm. Poor women, they had no hope of a speedy delivery. They were being driven to a prison through no fault of their own. We passed an extraordinarily foul-smelling building. Later, I learned that it was the kitchen. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. I decided then and there that I would try by every means to make my mission a benefit to my suffering sisters, that I would show how they are committed without ample trial. Mm. And so she was ha happy that she had actually finally was get able to get Into in there, but it, then but... realized, you know, the people she was with just uh, and, she had empathy for and them. And she was asked to write it as a happy story because <laughs> she was supposed to examine it as being a good thing. Well, no, she was. Well, they, they, no, I, no, I think they so. told her write whatever you find. You know, okay. they said yeah. write, write about yeah. whatever you find. Whatever you find, you know, good, bad, or indifferent. Write what you find. And I think by see. that time she had the reputation of of telling it like it was, right. whether it was <laughs> based popular on Mexico. Or not. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, Nellie decided that once she was inside the asylum, that she would no longer pretend to be crazy, but would instead be her normal self. Soon upon arrival, she and her companions were taken to a waiting room where, one at a time, they were questioned by a doctor who spent more time flirting with a nurse than he did listening to their answers. Quote, he gave the nurse more attention than he did me, and asked her six questions to every one of me. I told him that I was not sick, and I do not want to stay here. No one has a right to shut me up in this manner. He took no notice of my remarks, and after completing his writing, he got up and left. I went back with my companions to the sitting room. Mm. Nellie went on to detail the poor treatment of the patients, inedible food, and the cruelty of the nursing staff. She witnessed physical and emotional abuse on a, res a regular basis. During the day, the patients were kept busy cleaning the floors and hallways. When they were not working, they were expected to sit still on hard wooden benches. Quote, there was no reading material and nothing to do to pass the time. During bath time, the women were lined up in a tiled room where they were stripped of their clothes. They were each doused with a bucket of cold water and then given a dirty towel to dry off with. All the women, the same towel. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Uh, she, heard, she heard details from patients who had been on other wards of the hospital and reported more serious abuse. Routinely, patients were held down by the nurses and choked, punched, and kicked. Mm -hmm. Nellie noticed that the women who had come to Blackwell's Island with her were beginning to deteriorate. Ann Neville told her that she couldn't eat the food and she was beginning to sink into despair. Quote, I always made a point of telling the doctors I was sane and asking to be released. But the more I endeavored to assure them of my sanity, the more they doubted it. I told one doctor that I am sane, have always been so, and I must insist on a thorough examination or be released. Several of the women here are also sane. Why can't they be free? The doctor said, they are insane and suffering from delusions. That was his only reply. On her tenth day, the world, the, her newspaper, hired a lawyer to go to Blackwell's Island to state that friends of Nellie's would take her in if she would agree to leave the asylum and go with him. This, in fact, was just a show in front of the asylum staff. Of course, Nellie agreed, though she admitted that she felt guilty about leaving her companions right. on the island. The following Sunday, the world printed Nellie's story on its front page. Ten days in, an, in a madhouse became a sensation in New York. Mm. Later, her work was published in a book by the same name and was highly acclaimed across the United States. Within a month, a grand jury was called to investigate Nellie's claims. Her investigation led to nationwide reforms of asylums and the treatment of the mentally ill. It also led to broad fame and acclaim for Nellie Bly. Wow. But you know she's making a lot of enemies. Oh, right. yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. There's a pile doing up. It this. You know, I taught in a mental hospital... Uh, back up in Washington State uh, many years ago. And it is it is a very difficult work. And sometimes you do see patients that are that are being not treated the correct way and, uh, uh, and it concerns you. And so, you know, you, you know, you go through the formality of writing statements and things, what you've seen, but still sometimes nothing changes, you know. Right. So. Well, and, and like you said, it is hard work. You know, where it, where I think it right. desensitizes it, some people. It would desensitize some people. And, right. And, and uh, just. I found it very interesting. Their empathy. I always enjoyed working with those folks, but it uh, was was difficult work for sure. Yes, I'm sure. All I right. Mean, on to our, our next adventure now. So in, in 
1872, Jules Verne's story of Phileas Fogg and his adventures in the book Around the World in 80 Days had created a worldwide sensation. The story was published in segments and released to newspapers in Paris and from there carried by other newspapers in Europe, Asia, and North America. So it was like a serial. I mean, That's right. It, it, just certain chapters got put, put out at one time then. So Around the World in 80 Days was on everyone's mind. In fact, people were actually bet, taking bets on whether Fogg and his servant – uh, Passapartout, Passapartout uh, would complete the journey in time. Steamship lines offered Verne handsome amounts of money if he would write about fog completing his circuit on one of their ocean liners. Yeah, they wanted him to have him come in, uh, have him come in on our ship and uh, win the win the uh, tour, and uh, we'll pay you handsomely. You know? So one night, sixteen years later, Nellie Bly had a problem. Uh -oh. I had spent, quote, I had spent a greater part of the day and half the night vainly trying to fasten on some idea for a newspaper article. It was my custom to think up ideas on Sunday and lay them before my editor for his approval or disapproval on Monday. Right. But I, ideas did not come to me that day, and 3 o'clock in the morning found me weary and with an aching head tossing about in my bed. <laughs> I thought, We've all had those nights, I think. Yeah. There, yeah. Continue <laughs> to do this. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought fretfully, I wish I were at the other end of the earth. Then I thought, why not? I need a vacation. <laughs> why not take a trip around the world? The idea of a trip around the world pleased me, and I added, if I could do it as quickly as Phileas Fogg did, I should go. Yeah, good for you. So the next morning before going to the newspaper office, she went to a steamship company's office and looked over the various timetables. Quote, if I had found the elixir of life, I should not have felt better than I did when I conceived a hope that a tour of the world might be made in less than... And then even less than 80 days. Oh, so they're looking at their schedule. She thought hey, it could work even better. That's than right. When he did it. That's yeah, right. I see. So arriving at the New York <laughs> World Office, her editor was waiting for her. Have any ideas, he asked. One, I want to go around the world in 80 days or less. I think I can beat Phileas Fogg's record. May I try it? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> her editor informed her that the office had actually thought of the same idea before but with the intention of sending a man. Oh. Dun, However, dun, dun. he offered to support her idea and suggested they meet with the business manager. This man was not so supportive. <laughs> Quote, it, it is impossible for you to do it. In the first place, you're a woman and would need a protector. And even if it were possible for you to travel alone, you would need to carry so much baggage. Oh, yeah. Everybody well, knows that. <laughs> you know, yeah. all that she's luggage. constantly Ooh. looking for her trunks. Yeah. I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Right. Okay. Maybe so, at a point. Well, anyway. <laughs> so he said, you would need to carry so much baggage that it would detain you in making rapid changes. Yeah, just think no of customs. <laughs> but a man could do this. Ooh. Ooh. He very, laid down a gauntlet. Very well, Nellie said angrily. Start the man, and I will start the same day for some other newspaper and beat him. Ooh. So, <clears> hey, <throat> I believe you would, said that business manager. <laughs> Nellie was promised that if the paper did decide to back the trip, that she would be the one to take it. Wow, that was that was a pretty intense meeting, but uh, <laughs> I like I like the way she comes up with it. Right. Oh yeah, yeah. We'll okay. see about oh, that. Only a man can. Do it. Oh yeah. Okay, go ahead and start him, and I'll go do it for some other paper, and I'll do it faster. <laughs> yeah, just watch me. Well, for the next year, she busied herself with other projects and news articles. She was indeed one of the world's best journalists. Then one cold, wet evening, she was given a summons late in the afternoon to come to the editor's office, wondering what she was going to be scolded for. This has probably been happening. Right. She Did went you? in and sat beside the editor, wait, editor, waiting for him to speak. Quote, can you start around the world the day after tomorrow? I can start this minute, she quickly answered. <laughs> you know, I've heard it said Poof, if somebody tells you you can't do anything, do it yeah. and take pictures. <laughs> right. With only one day to make final preparations, she visited a dressmaker and told him what she wanted and that she needed it that day. Quote, I want a dress that will stand constant wear for three months. She overcame his protestations of the quick turnaround by saying, nonsense, I have no doubt that you can do it. The dress was ready by 5 p.m. <laughs> Persuasive. <laughs> Quote, I bought one handbag with the determination to confine my luggage to its limit. She would take with her the dress she would wear every day, a sturdy overcoat, several changes of underwear, her toiletry essentials, and some ink and writing paper. 
That night, she wrote letters to a few friends telling them that she would be out of town for a while. <laughs> she also stopped back at the world office and was given 200 British pounds in gold and banknotes. She also carried some American gold and paper money as a test to see, quote, if American money was known outside of America. <laughs> <laughs> The gold I carried in my pocket and the banknotes in a chamois skin bag, which I tied around my neck. Mm. Okay, so let's just take a let's just step back from Nelly and talk <laughs> about this for a minute. Do you know? Okay, so all of this is happening in the early 1900s. No, eight, or, late 18, or late 18, 18, 18 like 87, the 80s. Yeah. Right, okay. 88. But in the early 1800s, steam powered engines were gaining popularity and they were greatly increasing the speed of travel. Right. And we've talked about it before. Women how, were not initially allowed to travel by steam engines since it was determined that a <laughs> yes. woman's uterus, apparently considered a free floating organ, would go bouncing <laughs> around inside her body and possibly be flung out. Yeah. What's it doing and in so, my hand? <laughs> And I remember you, Steve, saying something about the fear that the uterus was going to go on a walkabout. Uh, <laughs> conductor, my uterus is flung out of my mouth. Can you? <laughs> yeah. Break. I, I can pick it up for me. Anyway. Okay. Can you help me find it? Um, so, Next to so, my trunks. So this isn't that far after that that she's doing it. And uh, and I just wanted to to bring light some – some. Uh, well, let me tell you about this woman. From Wikipedia – Catherine Virginia Switzer. Have you ever heard of her? No. Okay, so she was born in 1947 and became the first woman to run the ba Boston Marathon as an officially registered competitor. Oh, okay. So oh, this wow. is much later. Yeah, right? 1904 yeah. after World well, Okay. And she yeah. was an officially, officially registered competitor. Just because it was official didn't mean it went that smoothly. Yeah. <laughs> the race took place in 1967, and during her run, race manager Jock Semple assaulted her. He tried oh, yeah. to grab her bib number and stop her from competing. He first knocked down Switzer's trainer and fellow runner, Arnie Briggs, when he tried to protect her. But Switzer's boyfriend, Thomas Miller, who was running along with her, managed to shove Semple to the ground, and Switzer was able to complete the race. Wow. He didn't wow. even want her there. Wow. The Amateur Athletic Union banned women. Okay, this is this was their, their response to it, okay? Mm -hmm. They banned women from competing in races against men as a result of her run. Uh -huh. It wasn't until 1972 that the Boston Marathon established an official women's race. That's that not not that long ago. Wow. I was in junior high school. Uh -uh. So. Uh -uh. so, okay, so that's 1970s. Let's talk about women's rights in 1970s. So, from an article in USA Today, author Jessica Hill explores some facts. And it's, she does some fact checking on a list of nine things a woman couldn't do in 1971. That's been going around on social media, and we're not going to go all nine of them. Right. But, um, so you guys tell me if you think it's true. So. In 1970s, could she, could a woman get a credit card in her name? In her own name? In her own name. You would think so. Hill says that banks could refuse women a credit card until the Equal Credit Opportunity Act of 1974 wow. was assigned into law. Hmm. Wow. Um, could they be guaranteed that they would not get fired from their job for getting pregnant? No. Hmm. Mm -mm. The Pregnancy Discrimination Act wasn't adopted until 1978. Wow. Um. How about serve on a jury? Yeah, well, I, think I thought women could serve on juries. Okay, you're yeah. you're right. Yeah, yeah. You're right and kind of wrong. Um, of women course. could serve on federal juries as early as 1957, but the law varied from state to state. Yeah. And it wasn't until 1978 that all 50 states allowed women to serve. Somewhere I read, uh, oddly enough, Wyoming was the first state to put women on a jury <laughs> and, <laughs> back in the 1890s or something like that. But, yeah. Okay, so <laughs> so you want to take a guess at what year women were allowed to fight on the front lines? Women in the military. Um, would it have been during the Gulf War, maybe, in the 1990s? Mm, no, it was a big deal back then. It was a big controversy back then. So it was oh. 2013. Really? It was 2013. Than, Ten years ago. Wow. Okay, so back to Nellie Bly and her amazing travels. Well, well, well I've got to tell you one more woman thing. Okay. My, my mother uh, led the Pantsuit Rebellion I remember at, you saying that. at the <laughs> county courthouse, where she worked for many, many years. That was 1973. Yeah, so up until then, women did, always had to wear dresses. But uh, Didn't you come home to her being on the phone? That, yeah, her she was on. She, yeah, well, I thought she was talking to my teachers, finding out what I hadn't been doing. But, cause she didn't talk on the phone that much, but, you know, she was calling all the other girls in the office and be like, Lois, this is Jerry. I just thought you'd want to know I'm going to wear my pantsuit tomorrow. 
And I said, I asked her, what if nobody else does? That's okay. I'm going to wear mine. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to put it into a stop to this. My, my mother was a force to be reckoned with. So, <laughs> All right. Well, now back to Nellie. On Thursday, November 14th, 1889, at 9.40 a.m., I started on my tour around the world. My intention was to make this trip in 75 days. Several friends were on hand to see her off. Keep up your courage, they said to me while they gave my hand a farewell clasp. As the ship pulled past the Statue of Liberty and out of the harbor, Nellie began to have second thoughts about this adventure. Shall I ever get back? Intense heat, bitter cold, terrible storms, shipwrecks, fevers. All such thoughts have been drummed into me. However, the beautiful sunny morning and the calm waters brightened her spirits. Okay, that makes me think, like, her mom had to be so afraid <laughs> for her. You know, was she a supporter? Was she the one telling well, her these oh, things? Oh, you got this, or, kid. You know, yeah. Could well, be, I mean, of course, she went to Mexico with her. You yeah, know, mom true, went to Mexico true, with her. True, but now she's letting her daughter go, go around the world. Oh, right. As a mom, I understand. <laughs> Right. Well, to uh, sustain interest in the story, the world organized a Nellie Bly guessing match in which <laughs> readers were asked to estimate Bly's arrival time to the second, with a grand prize consisting of a trip to Europe along with spending money, in addition to the paper posted updates of her progress as she cabled in reports from the various ports of call. Now, they weren't really going out. You've got to guess it to the second that she comes back. You know, that's that's uh, they were really going out on a limb, I don't think. <laughs> right. <laughs> on the Atlantic crossing, she experienced her first bout of seasickness. Quote, I had a very strong determination to resist my body's impulses. But yet, in the bottom of my heart, I was little had a little faint feeling that I had found something even stronger than my own willpower. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know some people that way. Yeah. Um. After several days of rough travel, the ship arrived in Southampton, England, several hours ahead of schedule. There she received a telegram telling her that none other than Jules Verne himself was cheering her on, and that if she could spare a few hours while she was in France, uh, that he would love to meet her. Yeah. Quote, oh, how I would love to meet him, she exclaimed, and the arrangements were made. A brief train ride to London and a whirlwind tour of its famous sites brought her to another train for the coast of England, and then a ferry for the crossing over to France, and then train again to Amiens. There, Mr. and Mrs. Jules Verne, accompanied by an English-speaking Paris journalist, were waiting on the platform. Quote, Jules Verne's bright eyes beamed on me with interest and kindliness, and Madame Verne, greeted me with the cordiality of a cherished friend. Mm. Before I had been many minutes in their company, they had won my everlasting respect and devotion. Oh, oh wow. That? Yeah. They drove her in their carriage to their home nearby. Quote, Madame Verne led the way into a large sitting room that was dusky with the early shade of a wintry evening. With her own hands, she touched a match to the pile of dry wood that lay in the wide open fireplace. Soon a bright fire was crackling in the grate, throwing a soft, warm light over the dark room. A fine white Angora cat came rubbing up against my knee. Then, seeing Madame Verne, went to her and boldly crawled up into her lap, as if assured of a cordial welcome. Mr. Verne and the journalist soon joined us in this comfortable, lovely room. Mr. Verne sat forward on the edge of his chair. His snow-white hair, rather long and heavy, was standing up in artistic disorder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. his, his full beard, rivaling, uh, rivaling his hair in its snowiness, hid the lower part of his face. His bright eyes, the rapidity of his speech, and the quick movements of the firm white hands all bespoke energy, life with enthusiasm. You see, she really was a good writer. Oh, yeah. yeah, so so descriptive. After some brief conversation being translated through the journalist, Mr. Verne and Miss Bly compared notes about her trip and that taken by his character, Phileas Fogg. He even showed her a map which he had used to chart the route that Phileas Fogg would take. The wow. blue pencil marks were still visible. And he'd written that like you know, almost 20 years before. Then Nellie asked if uh, he would show her his study. Quote, he said that he was only too happy to show it to me, and immediately Madame Verne sprang to her feet and lighted the gas jets in the hallway and up a winding staircase. Soon they came to a door that Madame Verne opened and lit the gas light inside. I was astonished. 
I had expected, judging from the rest of the house, that Mr. Vern's study would be a room of ample proportions and richly furnished. But when I stood in Mr. Vern's study, I was speechless with surprise. He opened a latticed window, the only window in the room, which was very small. It was also very modest and bare. Before the window was a flat-topped desk, upon which was a neat little pile of white paper. It was part of a manuscript, a novel, that he was working on. I looked at the very neat penmanship. I was more impressed than ever with the extreme tidiness of this French author. One bottle of ink and one pen holder was all that shared the desk with the manuscript. There was but one chair in the room, and it stood before the desk. Here, in this room, with these meager surroundings, Jules Verne had written the books that have thrilled millions and brought him everlasting fame. So many great books wow. with Jules Verne. You know. Yeah, oh, that's seriously. right. And, and his study surprises me, too. Right. You know, because when you think of Jules, Jules Verne, you think steampunk and all right. of that. Yeah. And you would think that it would be just this Victorian um, clutter. Right. And his, of just all the stuff that he's put into his books right yeah. as just yeah. visuals yeah i guess i mean you know <laughs> I, my office is cluttered <laughs> <laughs> upon returning to the sitting room mr burns said through the translator if you do it in 79 days i shall applaud you with both hands before she left for the train that would carry her to paris and then on to the rest of her journey mr Vern brought out a bottle of wine and proposed the toast quote in compliment to me, he endeavored to speak to me in English, and he did succeed in saying, as his glass tipped mine, Good luck, Nellie Bly. Oh, oh wow. <laughs> I know she loved meeting him. Yeah, no doubt. During her travels around the world, Bly went through England, France, Italy, the Suez Canal, Ceylon, or Sri Lanka, the Straits of Settlements of Pen Penang. Is that how you say yeah, that, Penang? Penang, yeah. And Singapore, Hong Kong, Japan, and across the United States. The development of official submarine cable networks and the electric telegraph allowed Bly to send short pro progress reports, although longer dispatches had to be had to travel by regular post and thus were often delayed by several weeks. Can you imagine what she would do with today's technology? Right, no, yeah. right. Something else. But, yeah, the, the submarine cables... Were I mean underwater cables were that was pretty pretty, pretty major advanced at that yes. advancement right. at that time you know that she could at least send word that she'd arrived arrived at certain posts. Bly traveled using steamships and the existing railroad systems, which caused occasional setbacks, particularly on the Asian leg of her trip. During these stops, she visited a leper colony in China and in Singapore. She bought a monkey. She bought a <laughs> monkey, yes. Bought a monkey why and carried she... him home the rest of the way oh, with her. Oh, <laughs> why? Okay. As a result of... I think it was an impulse buy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's cute. <laughs> oh, mercy. As... <laughs> Please, no. <laughs> As a result of rough weather on her Pacific crossing, she arrived in San Francisco on the White Star Line ship RMS Oceanic on January 21st, two days behind schedule. Uh-oh. However, world owner Pulitzer, wor okay, world Pulitzer. owner, the newspaper owner, let me say that. Pulitzer, yeah. Pulitzer. Uh, charter, chartered a private train to bring her home, and she arrived back in New Jersey on January 25th, 1890 at 3.51 p.m. She had completed her journey in just over 72 days from her departure. 72 oh, days. Wow. Take that. Right. Yeah. Boom. She had circumnavigated the globe, traveling alone for almost the entire journey. Bly's journey was a world record, although it was bettered a few months later by George Francis Train, whose first circumnavigation in 1870 possibly had been the inspiration for Verne's novel. In 19, I'm sorry, in 1895, Bly married millionaire manufacturer Robert Seaman. Bly was 31 and Seaman was 73. That was what when you call your May-December wedding right there, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Due to her husband's failing health, she left journalism and succeeded her husband as head of the Ironclad Manufacturing Company, which made steel containers such as milk cans and boilers. After her husband died, though, Nellie took over the company and is credited with creating patents for Nuke Milk Can and a stacking garbage can. Yeah, yeah, I like those. <laughs> yeah. The company proved to be too difficult for her to manage, though. However, as a com as a combination of her negligence and embezzlement by a factory manager caused the company to go bankrupt. Oh, yeah. man. 
Nellie returned to journalism. So, you know, she returned to her first love. That's what where she was really new. Yeah. Right. With What's the it? outbreak of World War One, she wrote from the front lines of Eastern Europe and was even arrested when she was <laughs> mistaken as a British spy. I mean, this, this girl lived, right? Back home, she covered the heated women's suffrage movement. She correctly predicted that women would finally get the get the vote, the right to vote, in 1920. Nellie died from pneumonia on January 27, 1922, in New York. She is buried at Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx. And so all of this information, uh, Dr. Meeker pulled together. Thank you, Steve. Good job, Steve. From uh, factinate.com, spartacuseducational.com, Wikipedia, and also from her personal autobiography. Her personal autobiography is such a great read. And, uh, you know, uh, it's so she's such a descriptive writer. She and really was. We're giving you just the highlights. Uh, there's so much more detail. And so I highly recommend that you, you know, get that, uh, get it on Kindle or get it wherever you can and uh, enjoy her, her autobiography. It's really, really quite, and she includes all three of these major stories of her life. And it was amazing that she she was able to do all of this and break down a lot of barriers, but right. she w- she was so empathetic and she had... Uh, I mean, what she did did some good. She yes, really made exactly. Some yeah. change in Change things, yeah, for sure. And now it's time, boys and girls, for the trivia challenge. <laughs> All right, trivia challenge. You know how this works. Like and follow our Facebook page at Remnant Stew Podcast. Like and share this episode post. Put your answer to the trivia challenge question in the comments of that post. The first person to do all that will be the winner and will be mentioned in an upcoming episode of Remnant Stew. So what's our question today, Leah? Okay, so this involves another intrepid woman. Oh, good. In spite of a hunting accident that left her disabled, this woman became one of the most successful spies of World War II, as well as the most highly decorated female civilian during that war. Who was she? Oh, that's a good question. Interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> Check out our Facebook and Instagram pages at Remnants 2 Podcast. Drop us an email at staycurious at remnants2.com. Just to say hi or if you have any topics you want us to cover in future episodes, let us know. Remnant Stew is created by me, Leah Lamp. Dr. Stephen Meeker and I research, write, and host each episode, along with cringy commentary by our audio producer, <laughs> Philip Singfeld. You're welcome. Well, Phil, <laughs> Phil really does make us sound good. I he get does. Say, thank you, Phil. Theme music is by Kevin McLeod with voiceover by Morgan Hughes. Special thanks goes out to Judy Meeker and Harvin Gold. Well, now, before you go, please hit the follow button so you won't miss an episode. Head over to Apple Music and leave us a review. Share Remnants Do with your friends, your family, your travel agent, your hairstylist, your local author, your boarding house matron, and Judge Duffy if you run into him. Until next time, remember to choose to be kind and, and always, always stay, stay curious. curious.